made that you think were, you know, without which you would not be here today? Well, uh, one very important one is to meet your guru in person. I knew that was essential. Although I, every day I emailed and somehow or other what, I had contact with Babaji, I knew it was critical for me to meet, meet him. Uh, that was like a decision I knew had to be done sooner or later. So I was just expecting vacations or something to come near to meet him. And then after the meeting, then I would decide, oh, I like or I don't like. Is it, this is real or this is just phony? And, and unfortunately, well, uh, he, he accepted my invitation to come to Mexico. And that, that meeting was, was a very important turning point because from that point, m uh, my learning was much faster. And of course, I still didn't have full confidence that, oh, this is the real thing, right? This is the path that I want to follow or the real thing. It took me still a little, I guess a year or something. Even after meeting Babaji, more conversations and like that. And the, the next turning point is chanting. When I was chanting intensively, not just like four rounds, or but that I did 32, I, I strive to do much more than what I did every day in single particular days. I said, oh, this is weekend, I have nothing else to do. Okay, I'm gonna chant as much as I can. And I chanted 40 rounds, 50 rounds, which for me was like, whoa. And those events, that's when, I, when you chant so much intensively, constantly, um, that makes solid grounding. Then you have experience of what it feels to be closer to Krishna and then, ah, <laughs> very important. You mentioned that there was still a period over which you, were, you had to take to overcome doubts that you had. Mm -hmm. uh, what were these doubts that you had and how did, like, what happened that made these doubts vanish? Well, for one thing, is, is this guru bona fide? Or that's, are you trying to be? That's, okay. a, that's any, any d disciple should ask this question and evaluate his guru. Of course, he doesn't have a clue how to choose a guru. <laughs> Later on, you discover it's, it's the other way around. But, but at least with the, with the basic intelligence that one has, one looks at the guru and, and I did this several times. I thought to myself, I'll ask the hardest questions I can find about spiritual life that I could imagine and ask them to Babaji. And these were questions that I had not even a clue what were the answers. And every time I did this kind of question to Babaji, every single time I was like, ah, he knows. Because he answered with authority, not with just sentiment or some nonsense, you know. He, uh, he replied in a very scientific way. And, and this helped me a lot. Then the chanting, and then more association with Babaji himself, and reading the scriptures. That was also very, very important. Everything I read that I could actually confirm, some things you can't, like this, the distance to the moon or whatever. <laughs> But the things you can, like in Bhagavad Gita, the three modes of nature, every single sentence I tested on my daily job and like that, and it was perfectly matching. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so basically, time went by, and every day was stronger and stronger and stronger. And there comes a point where it's so strong that there's no more doubt. There's no more. And this is the point at which you make a commitment that I am 150% committed to this path. Yeah, it increases. It increases gradually until it comes to the, to the maximum, full surrender. I think it still increases over time. It, it actually increases even further. It's, it's like never-ending stuff, yeah, spiritual. <laughs> if, you, if you had to go back, uh, and do this whole transition again, 
Mm -hmm. Are there things that you would have done differently or you think could have been done differently? Or do you think everything happened just the way it, it should have happened? Yeah, I don't think I could improve it really. Especially dealing with family and like that. It's like, in any case, they would reject. They wouldn't like the idea. So, uh, even if I would be completely polite or slow, they wouldn't like it anyway. So, I don't think there's any improve, improvement I could do. Have you had any, any success at explaining this philosophy to someone else or making devotees out of, out of people that you've met in your life? Well, I think that would be Graciela. Well, the, before Graciela, there was Mauricio, one cousin, one little cousin. And uh, it was a nasty story. He became devotee and everything. He was chanting, following the principles. But then her, uh, his mother forced him to eat meat and reject spiritual life. And she wanted to force him to, to read the Bible and like that. She completely freaked out with Prabhupada. <laughs> so, so, so this cousin basically became crazy because he had one heart desire and the orders were different. And he like, cuckoo. six months later, he was hearing heavy metal and completely like lost. And he had no inner life. And the other case was Graciela, which I hired an assistant for my job. I, mean, I, would, I knew I needed someone to replace me when I left, so I particularly looked for a person who was interested in spiritual life. And she, she got an interview and everything, and she said, yeah, God for me is the most important. So it was great because every day we would speak about God and how to serve God and spiritual life and like that. And gradually just as usual, <laughs> with Vedic principles, there's not much to argue. And she basically started becoming vegetarian and chanting rounds and like that. And after a while, she, she was, well, she still is devotee. And she takes care of the deities in Mexico, Jagannath deities and like that. And where you are right now uh, in your life, right? Uh, do you think things could be different? Would you rather things are different or are you very satisfied with uh, your current situation? Well, what is your current situation materially and spiritually? Well, I think uh, it's very clear that for us, for ourselves, we are okay. We have a nice place to live and we can, we're really not worried materially speaking. And spiritually, uh, I'm taking it a little bit slower. I'm doing the university program, but I was chanting 64 rounds, now I reduced to 16, because uh, this, there's so many things we have to solve first. And this is one of the things I, I was learning about today, that all our school system has been completely training me in such a way to, that I'm disconnected from from real life, you know, completely exploited and cheated and oh yeah, yeah. So, currently, I feel very good with my spiritual life. I don't have any single doubt about this, that this is the right path. Now I'm in the fight of overcoming all this mental training that I've been dealing with for years. And I feel worried because we really need to be self-sufficient and learn. I don't even know how to grow a potato. I mean, really, I have no clue. My my only abilities is to computers. That's it. But I I have no clue how to raise a potato or milk a cow. Things that are really useful, you know. <laughs> but there, there's no electricity. What am I going to going to do program <laughs> no so I, I think I'm, I'm in this point where I realize how 
in a big problem we're in. We're still living in the city. We don't have self-sufficiency. We're working on that. That's our goal and like that. But still, it's like okay, <laughs> we to get there. We still, we have to do a big effort. And then maybe then again focus on a strong spiritual life. But once being out there, we're still part of this nonsense civilization, <laughs> and that's not very good. And what is your current relationship with with material life and the material world and your friends and family who are not devotees? Mm. Uh, how do you relate to them now? I have almost no relationship. I have decided to to isolate myself from that because every time I contact any family member, it's just sentimental. That 